So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for having us here today. My name is Dr. Olivia Goldman. I am a postdoctoral fellow at the James A. Haley VA in Tampa, Florida. I specialize in working with veterans and active service members with PTSD and co-occurring mental health diagnoses. And I am so lucky to be joined today by my wonderful co-facilitators and mentors who will go ahead and introduce themselves. My name is Dr. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Heather Kikos. I am also a clinical psychologist at the James Haley VA, um, and I am an assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of South Florida in their Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences, and I am very excited to be here. Thanks all for having me. And I'm Dr. Jenny Bannister, psychologist at the James A. Haley uh, VA as well um, in the PTSD clinic. I'm also a local site investigator on Dr. Suzanne Decker's um, multi-site DBT grant for veterans with a recent suicide attempt, and also a national consultant for cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy for PTSD. Very excited you guys are here. Thank you both so much. So we are really excited to be here today. Um, today we're going to be presenting on how shame may present in folks with BPD as anger and how as providers we can address that anger in session. We will be monitoring the chat today, um, but I do ask uh, if you can hold off on questions um, until the end of the presentation. We'll make sure that we allot some time. That way we can get through everything here today. Um, just a little disclosure, uh, the workshops are currently being recorded um, and will be accessible to you at the end of the conference. Um, so if you are wanting to share, uh, just be mindful of any particular details that might be sensitive to you. Um, and our slides will also be posted to the conference website and available for, for download. Just our little obligatory uh, disclaimer here that the contents of this presentation represent our views and not that of the VA. We have no disclosures as part of this presentation. So our goals for today are really to foster an understanding of how shame presents in individuals who have co-occurring borderline personality disorder and trauma histories. We'll be talking about primary and secondary emotions and how experiences of shame can manifest as treatment interfering behaviors. Finally, we'll learn some skills to respond to shame and aggression in real life. And if we have some brave souls out there, put it into practice. So while this may be familiar to many of you, I just wanted to take a brief moment to highlight the diagnostic criteria for borderline personality disorder according to the DSM-5 and um, complex PTSD according to the ICD-11. So um, CPTSD incorporates the core symptoms of classical PTSD, so the re-experiencing, avoiding, and hypervigilance in addition to three additional symptom groups. This is emotion regulation difficulties, um, relationship difficulties, and negative self-concept. Now, as you can see highlighted on the screen, we see a cluster of symptoms in folks, a similar cluster of symptoms in folks with BPD. However, a personality disorder is an enduring pattern of inner experience or behavior, but that tends to be more pervasive and inflexible and stable over time. Whereas PTSD and CPTSD is a mental health condition that can be caused as a reaction to a stressful life event. Um, and Cloutier and uh, many other researchers have explored sort of the nuances of these distinct clinical presentations. So as humans, we all experience a range of emotions. Research by Tangney highlights that our emotion disposition is our ability to experience those emotions across a range of situations. Now, I'm going to go through a couple of key terms here that are, are significant and will kind of come up in the research that I referenced today, starting with the concepts of guilt and shame. Now, Guilt and shame are often misused interchangeably. However, they are distinct emotional states which can lead to different action urges. So guilt arises out of an action that we took or we didn't take. Um, and it is often an uncomfortable emotion that occurs when a person has transgressed some social norm. Um, so guilt focuses on our behavior. We might say things like, I did something bad. 
whereas shame often arises as a result of a negative evaluation by others. Um, and so shame becomes more of a global attribution of the self. Rather than I did something bad, we might say things like I am bad. Um, both shame and guilt are often referred to as moral emotions. And moral emotions have a really powerful influence on our choices and behavior because they provide us feedback regarding anticipated behavior and actual behavior. So um, Andrews uh, looked at state shame uh, versus trait shame. And state shame can be identified as like a momentary experience of shame in response to an event. So that internal experience that we have following being bullied or ridiculed or judged. Whereas trait shame acts more like a personality trait. It can involve very painful um, negative feelings such as hopelessness or helplessness and a desire to hide personal flaws. Um, Cohen um, and Wolf kind of expanded on the idea of um, trait shame in, in uh, discussing both guilt proneness and shame proneness. So, Guilt proneness is a personality trait indicative of more of a predisposition to experience negative feelings about a personal wrongdoing. Whereas a shame prone person would be more inclined to anticipate shame in response to a range of potential behaviors and outcomes. And when we're talking about moral emotions, it's also really um, important to talk about the concept of moral injury. And moral injury is the damage that's done to one's own conscious or moral compass when a person perpetrates, witnesses, or maybe fails to prevent acts that transgress their own moral beliefs or ethical codes of conduct. Now, moral injury in itself isn't a mental health condition, but it's oftentimes correlated with um, negative mental health um, symptoms such as depression, anxiety, relationship problems, and increased risk of suicide, to name a few. So researchers have found that there is a high lifetime co-occurrence um, between PTSD and BPD. Research by Bazzatello highlighted that there are several important factors associated with onset, early onset of BPD, including temperamental traits, so like negative emotionality, environmental factors, um, and traumatic experiences. So that can include um, forms of abuse. Research uh, by Pagura demonstrated that individuals who had co-occurring BPD and PTSD carry a significantly greater burden of illness than either diagnosis alone. And this was really evident in terms of more symptoms, higher rates of comorbidity with other mental health conditions, increased suicide risk, um, and poorer health quality of life. Um, PTSD and BPD comorbidity among men is associated with the same negative correlates that we see in females. Um, <clears throat> but while we mentioned earlier, BPD and PTSD are distinct clinical presentations, both disorders are really associated with high levels of guilt and shame. So this is where we see some overlap um, by Dr. Frizzetti's um, presentation as well. So he's discussed the concept of primary emotions dating back to some of Greenberg's work, uh, work and evolutionary psychologists. Primary emotions are also known as basic or core emotions, and they tend to be manifested um, and recognized uni um, universally and across cultures. They are identified as primary because they come first. So they are the direct emotional reaction to a situation and they can really alert us about what our needs are. So for example, someone is being mean to you or someone that you love. Uh, you might get angry as a result and feel a need to protect or set boundaries. The feeling of anger is a primary emotion and it really helps you protect what's important to you by making it more likely for you to assert yourself. On the other hand, we have these things called secondary emotions. And secondary emotions aren't necessarily manifested or recognized universally or across cultures. And they involve both the conjunction of a primary emotion and an experience. Um, so all the basic feelings can also be secondary. Some are more common than others. Um, but for example, 
if someone who is important to you says something hurtful to you, you might become sad. That would be primary sadness. If experiencing sadness for some reason might be difficult to you, you might also notice that you get angry. And the anger is then a secondary reaction since it's a reaction to your sadness. The reason though that secondary emotions usually aren't helpful is that they cover up what you really feel and can send confusing signals to the outside world about what your needs are. So for example, if you're sad and need support or closeness, but you're signaling secondary anger, anger is going to tell others that they should probably stay away from you and cause them, um, and cause them to create distance. So research by Butchman found that patients with BPD reported higher levels of shame than controls, and there was a relationship between shame and elevated PTSD symptoms. Shame was often associated with suicidal ten tendencies and impulsive behaviors in people with BPD. Additionally, shame in BPD has been found to have negative association with um, self-esteem and quality of life while also having a positive association with increased anger um, and unstable interpersonal relationships, which are core symptoms of those folks with BPD. So <clears throat> frequent experiences of shame may develop into trait-like shame proneness and as a consequence impact self-esteem. Now, chronic experiences of shame early in development may be later replaced by a condition of chronic anger, which is adopted by the individual to kind of keep others away so that those shame feelings can't be detected or triggered. And shame experiences have actually been found to be associated with trait anger. Shame is also considered among the emotions that is the most difficult to regulate. Um, and trait shame was really linked to a lot of emotional suppression. So folks are likely to develop maladaptive emotion regulation strategies for shame that can lead to both internalizing like psychological distress and externalizing like aggression symptoms. Of note, um, women typically reported greater levels of shame and lower levels of self-esteem than men. Um, and women also reported greater levels of um, distress um, and hostility, whereas men had greater levels of emotional suppression and physical aggression. So there are many ways that folks will um, attempt to cope with the shame experience. And coping more broadly refers to affective, cognitive, or behavioral efforts to either handle or remove any threatening or harmful situations. Um, so the first way that folks might uh, cope is to attack the self. This is that inward directed anger and blame. So for um, a patient who's experienced um, sexual assault, they may report engaging in really excessive cleaning of their own body, sometimes with really harsh um, um, chemical cleaners. They may uh, report thoughts like I'm dirty or I'm bad. So that's one way that folks might present as attacking themselves. Withdrawal is more of the tendency to hide or withdraw when shamed. So this could be things like ignoring calls from a family member because I don't deserve anything good. I don't deserve to be happy. You know, they're better off anyway without me in their life. Um, you might also see this present as, as an individual staying in bed for three days straight, stopping practicing their, you know, basic ADLs. Avoidance um, can show up in two different ways. So cognitive avoidance, um, avoiding thoughts, memories, or feelings that might be anxiety producing, um, as well as behavioral avoidance. So avoiding people, places, things, objects, situations. Um, and in therapy, this might show up like a patient not doing their homework um, because it reminds them of their trauma. The attack other response um, is really that outward directed anger and blame. And so you might see this uh, when a patient says things like, you know, nothing we're doing is working. You said this therapy was going to help me and it's done nothing. You don't know what you're doing. Um, so that's oftentimes how that might present. 
Um, and then finally, we see adaptive coping. So this is really the acknowledgement of shame, um, encompassing self-validation and then repairs within the environment or the relationship as indicated. So for starters, being able to recognize emotion. I am feeling shame because I set a boundary and that's hard for me. I also am not a fan of how my tone was in setting it. Um, you might see repair to the self, so engaging in a, a self-soothing activity or repair with an other. So letting them know that, you know, we're not thrilled with their delivery of the boundary and really reiterating the boundary and or apologizing for yelling, depending on the situation. So in cultures that are more individualistic, one's primary responsibility is to oneself. And so it's often argued that guilt becomes a key motivator. I don't do something wrong um, because doing it would make me feel bad. Whereas in cultures that are more collectivistic, one's primary responsibility is to others, um, like a family, a tribe, religion, or other social entity. So it's often argued that shame is a key motivator. I don't do something wrong because doing it would make me look bad um, to my reference group. Now, borderline um, a personality disorder occurs in many different cultures around the world. Um, however, a diagnosis of a personality disorder um, constitutes like a cultural and social construct. Um, and Zimmerman has illustrated that borderline personality disorder is, is considered as an under-researched disorder as compared to other psychiatric conditions. Um, and Ron Ingsheim also pointed out that studies on borderline personality disorder within the cultural context are really minimal. Um, currently, there's a really low diagnostic prevalence of BPD in Asian cultures um, and really few studies on BPD phenomena using Asian populations. Um, in early work uh, in, uh, from Beiger, um, we saw that extremes of idealization and devaluation can oftentimes be fostered in cultures where authority figures are revered without any questioning. Um, and even the diagnosis of BBD, uh, BPD in like Chinese um, psychiatric communities contended that some of the BPD criteria, such as like fear of abandonment, um, are not actually appropriate in the Chinese cultural context, which values collectivistic identities and enmeshed relationships. Um, so what I really want um, to highlight here is that there's actually very little research that, um, that speaks to the unique experiences of this personality presentation across both collectivistic and individualistic cultures um, and how shame overlaps with that experience as well. Um, and how is this relevant when working with military veterans? Well, traumatic experiences can really create ethical dilemmas that result in moral injury. So, for example, a veteran might feel guilt or shame for violating their moral beliefs in combat. And as I mentioned earlier, moral injury is often associated with negative mental health correlates. Um, specifically, suicidal ideation uh, disproportionately affects veterans, and veterans with PTSD are at a particularly high risk for suicide. Um, researchers have found that um, in a sample of veterans with PTSD, shamefully accounted for the effects of PTSD on suicidal ideation, suggesting that um, shame may represent a key link between PTSD and suicidal ideation, um, and that it might be an effective point of treatment intervention to reduce that suicidal ideation among veterans with PTSD. There was also um, a, a relationship between shame um, and um, verbal aggression. So trait shame, um, but not trauma-related guilt, actually mediated the relationship between PTSD symptoms and verbal, verbal aggression. So what do we do with all this information? How do we address the shame and anger as it presents in session? Well, to build off of Linehan's work, um, she uh, um, you know, spoke to several different strategies that can be used in session to address um, shame and anger, starting from uh, validation. 
We see that there are many different levels of validation, but really the main takeaway here is to really listen to and observe what your patient is saying. We want to be able to accurately reflect, notice those nonverbals. We don't want to ever mind read um, and understand that behavior um, can be a function of past experiences and present experiences. Um, but when we get to the level six um, component of validation, we reach the a concept of radical genuineness. Um, and this is really about seeing each individual for who they are, their strengths and ability, and believing in your patient's um, capacity to change, treating them as an equal and not fragilizing them. The concept of irreverence uh, is really about confronting dysfunctional behaviors directly and sometimes even blankly. So if your patient says you're going to abandon me, um, you might say something like, well, you have been pretty hard up to this point and I still haven't abandoned you yet. Um, so it typically tends to be the reaction, uh, almost never the reaction that the patient expects, but it's designed to really push the patient um, off balance and move them when they're stuck and can be really effective um, when it's coming from a place of genuineness um, and is leaning into that strong and positive relationship. Values identification is helping your um, patient really identify, are they acting and living in a way um, uh, in line with their own values? Um, radical acceptance is just acknowledging the facts of the situation. Acceptance does not equal approval or agreeing. Um, I don't think that this is okay and I can't change what it is. And finally, we have the concept of contingency management. So um, typically we see that a level of care is often contingent on like behavioral discontrol, um, but we really want to use contingency management to reinforce and shape behavior to move it in the de desired direction, not away from it. So if a patient is acting out or endorsing excessive like self-harming or suicidal ideation, um, we don't want to negatively reinforce by having them, you know, increasing the amount of sessions that we have. We really want to shape their behavior so that they reduce reduce um, those disruptive behaviors. All right, so we wanted to um, give you guys some opportunity to practice um, with everything that we are discussing. And so we're actually going to go through a case example um, and we'll do a role play. And so I'm going to give a little bit of background on um, our, our patient. Um, so the patient is a 32-year-old Caucasian female, um, self-referred for treatment due to concerns of anxiety, um, uh, so things like ruminative thoughts, rapid heart rate, beat, difficulty concentrating, depressive symptoms such as tearfulness, social withdrawal, distressing memories, and interpersonal concerns like anger, lashing out. Um, and this has been so steadily increasing in the past six months. Um, she's had an unstable upbringing, so parents were divorced when Aria was five years old. Um, she experienced inconsistent caregiving. Uh, was exposed to inappropriate sexual behavior, physically abusive behaviors, and excessive substance use. Um, her father remarried uh, her stepmother who experienced her own mental health problems, lots of ACEs. Um, and trauma history is notable for sexual abuse at 13 years old um, by a neighborhood friend and wasn't believed when she told the family. Um, and then was held hostage by her stepmother and threatened to be harmed at 15 years old. Sexual abuse by half-brother at 30 years old, so more trauma into adulthood. Um, and then um, has found therapy in general to be ineffective. At the point that we're kind of dropping into therapy, this is gonna be um, session six. Um, so they have gone through a mindfulness exercise and they're gonna start to review homework. So with that, I'll hand over to Dr. Goldman and Aria. Okay, Aria, so how did your homework go from the past week? Can we talk about what happened at work first? I really cannot believe what my coworker said to me. I can't stop thinking about it. I can't sleep and, and I have to see them every day. Yeah, I can tell that that's really um, bothering you. Why don't we focus on our homework first um, and then we can have plenty of time to talk about that later on. I mean, I guess that's fine. It, it's just been a whole thing and it's more important than a stupid worksheet. Sure. I mean, I, I'm sensing that maybe you're a little bit frustrated that we're going to hold off on discussing that at this point. So it's just been a whole thing. It's, it's fine. It's fine. Just we can talk about it after. Okay. So why don't you go ahead then and pull out your homework from the past week? Well, 
you're not going to like what I have because I didn't write basically anything. Hmm. Well, why don't you just show me what you have? I still want to see it. Well, you know what? It's your fault that I couldn't finish it because, because you, you didn't even explain what, what to do. So, so it sounds like you had some questions about how to complete the homework. Yeah, you, you didn't even explain what to do. None of those questions made sense. I can't help but to notice that you've shifted a bit in your seat. What, what's coming up for you right now? You just didn't explain the assignment enough, so I don't know what the hell I should even be doing with this. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense that you might feel frustrated if you didn't know what to do with your assignment. Um, I'm wondering if you might be feeling a bit disappointed too. You know, those questions hit on some sensitive topics. I'm, I'm wondering what feelings uh, they might have brought up for you. I don't freaking know. You just didn't explain enough for me. And so it didn't make any sense. Well, do you think maybe we can figure it out together? What are, what are you noticing right now? I don't know. Hmm. Well, at the very least, it sounds like I didn't live up to my end of the therapy bargain over the past week to make sure that you felt comfortable with the assignment. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Uh, I'm sure you're just gonna kick me to the curb like everyone else. You made it very clear that homework was part of the therapy deal and that I had to get it done. Interesting. I, ha I haven't kicked you to the curb yet, have I? I guess not, but it's only a matter of time. Then I'm gonna get rid of you? I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm just so damn angry about the whole situation. Every time I think about this or, or I have to write about what happened to me, why didn't, why didn't anybody believe me? I was a kid. No one seems to really care. They just, they just find ways to get rid of me. Why would it be any different now? Hmm. You were a kid that deserved to be protected and you weren't? Something is obviously wrong with me. Nobody cared enough to protect me. It seems maybe like you're determining your own worth over off of their, you know, poor decisions and feel undeserving of protection. Is there any other way to feel about it? I mean, the facts are there. You know, this is, this is really tough stuff to talk about. I'm wondering, what might you say to a good friend if they had a similar story and, and they were blaming themselves for it? Well, and if it's a good friend, I guess I could, I guess I would tell them it's not their fault. They, they didn't ask for these things to happen. They were just a little kid. Hmm. So the facts are that they, they didn't ask for this terrible thing to happen. And, and yet it did. Um, I am, I imagine that would feel pretty disappointing. It does feel disappointing. And it, and I feel really sad. Oh, I'm gonna jump in here. What did you guys notice about this interaction? What felt like it went well? And feel free to unmute yourself. We're happy to kind of triage chat, chat as well, but we welcome people coming on mic if you feel comfortable. A lot of validation going on. A lot of mm -hmm. um, meet, meeting, meeting your client where she's at and not necessarily going down the path she's leading you, but choosing to follow um, the path of validating her emotions rather than um, her outbursts. Like saying kind of the validation and also seeing um, the like, not being shaming obviously, but like meeting where her where she was at with what she brought in from work wise. What else? 
I think it's really easy to get polarized with patients when they're angry and when that anger is directed towards you. Um, and so <laughs> I think that Olivia did a really good job of kind of staying curious, staying balanced. You know, we talk um, on our team kind of about being, uh, being like Buddha on the road. So you just kind of, you know, you're not taking one position or the other and really taking your time too. Cause I think too, when you really start to hit that shame and put your finger on what the primary emotion is, you can feel like, okay, now we got to do something with this. And so like really kind of taking your time and giving your, your patient space is so important. So I, I thought that was a really great example of that. You know, I'm happy that you saw that because that was something that we were pretty deliberate of hoping that we could show is that like not jumping in too quickly and giving it the space for the emotion to be there um, and to kind of work through it together. And I love that concept. I, I like to say a lot of times when I'm working with people and supervising, you know, to be a warm rock. Um, and you guys both kind of alluded to this where it's, you, know, you can meet her where she's at, the patient, and yet also sort of unwaver and what needs to be done and what's most effective. And so you have that balance of validation and kind of holding steady. And um, I'm glad that was portrayed as well. I like that. I'm going to borrow that warm rock. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. It's one of my faves in, in working with this population in particular, kind of how to balance. Realizing what time, Olivia, do you want to jump to the next question? Yeah, sure. So I'm curious um, for the group, where did you notice that shame was maybe coming up for the patient? So one of the questions we've got, what made you decide not to problem solve early in the session about what she could have um, called for, or that she could have called for further explanation of the homework? Mm. Oh, so something like going into problem solving, why she didn't call for skills coaching or something like that. Mm. I noticed the shame when you were discussing homework. Mm. Uh, what what in particular about the homework do you think um, was maybe eliciting some shame in the patient in Aria? Not understanding it, not not having done it, um, not meeting expectations, um, ready for more invalidation and kind of more criticism and labeling probably. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really really great insight. Um, into kind of that shame experience and what, what that was bringing up internally for her. I want to, um, I'm sorry, did I cut someone off? Oh, I, I was just going to add that when Heather was hiding her face with her hair, that showed almost like a child shame yeah. and covering up. Yes, love that you picked up on that, right? So these, these really subtle, where we might just think that this is kind of like, I'm thinking, right? But in this case, it was like, it was very much intentional to be hiding um, in a way where I couldn't, I felt very vulnerable and couldn't hide. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I wanted to just circle back to that question that Jean put in the chat as well too. Um, so Olivia, um, feel free to um, correct me on this or take a different approach, but you know, typically I find jumping into problem solving too early just opens up the door for that power struggle. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly if anger is presenting, it just feels like it's going to get into that match of whose voice can get louder and, and who can say what they want to say stronger um, and might not go anywhere effective. So that ability to really sit back, validate, oh, you're almost kind of playing a detective too, right? Is this anger? Mm -hmm. What is this about? Is there something else that might be going on? She, you know, she knows how to do the homework. So there's gotta be something, there's gotta be something else going on given that we were several sessions in and, and the, the therapist knew the patient. And these are things you might be kind of playing through in your mind and sort of helping you um, navigate where to go. And so leaning into that validation and sort of seeing what that buys you and then potentially being able to move into problem solving collaboratively um, to say something like, hey, so I'm wondering if, how do we prevent this from occurring next time? Like, how do we make sure that um, I can be more helpful to you with the homework and we would be, get, have plenty of time to talk about whatever went on during the week? And that might be able to lead into problem solving, how to engage in skills coaching more effectively or use that as, use that as, a, as a resource um, between sessions. Inclined wise to jump us into the second role play. 
Does that sound fair? Yeah, sure. Let's do so it. Gonna, Let's spice it up. <laughs> so we're going to rewind the tape um, and um, we're going to explore kind of how this could have gone differently. So kind of going back into that space with homework. Okay, Aria. So how did your homework go over the past week? <laughs> Can we can we talk about what happened at work first? I really cannot believe what my coworker did or said to me, and I can't I can't stop thinking about it. I can't sleep, and I have to keep seeing them every day, including after the session. I bet, but we need to focus our attention on the homework. You bet. You don't even want to listen to what I have to say. It's it's obviously something important, and clearly you don't give a crap. What the hell am I even? What am I even paying you for? This is the stuff I want to talk about, and you just you just care about a stupid homework assignment. Okay, so we're gonna pause the tape there. Um, how might you respond in this instance? You kind of you, you said something like, "Oh, that didn't come out how I wanted it to." Um, how might you repair? Or do you want to just tag it, Dr. Goldman? <laughs> <laughs> It's tough stuff. I think I would say something like, wow, I can see that I missed how, how important that was for me to acknowledge with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Love it. Mm -hmm. Kind of repair. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry I didn't give full attention to that for a moment. And um, to make sure you knew we were definitely going to prioritize it later in the session. Yeah, I, th I think I would um, actually you know, validated that was clearly something that was upsetting and I want to talk about it. And the reason that we got to focus on homework first is that we're going to talk about skills that you can use to hopefully more effectively manage what sounds like was a really difficult situation. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I want to validate, but I also want to get back into the change and stay true to the model so that I don't reinforce that you really can skip during the homework. Yep. Sure. sure. Mm -hmm. Balance. Middle path. Walk in the middle path. <laughs> well, in the interest of time, let me tag back in Dr. Goldman. Aria, you're right. That must have sounded so invalidating and not at all what I meant to say. I genuinely hear how frustrated this work situation is, and I understand that you would like some time to discuss this. I, I also know how important your goal of reducing your trauma symptoms are and how dedicated you've been to treatment. I'd hate to kind of derail all of our great momentum. Do you think that we can allot some time at the end of the session to address your work concern? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. You're right. I, I do feel like what, what we're doing has been helping. I, I feel better when I leave. But when I'm doing the homework on my own, it, it just becomes so overwhelming, especially when I have other things going on. Sure. And, and you have a lot on your plate right now. And uh, one of those things is that big trauma monster, right? It's just sitting in the middle of that plate, weighing it down. And all of these other stressors are sort of lumped on top of that. And I get that that can feel really overwhelming and exhausting to manage. And we know that even if we tackle these other stressors, that trauma monster is still going to be sitting there. Um, and so I'm wondering, um, for you, uh, you mentioned that one of your goals is really reducing those PTSD symptoms. Is this still in line with where you want to be? Um, yeah, I mean, ultimately, that's, that's what I want out of this. I, I don't want to be bothered by my traumas anymore. Mm -hmm. And I, I recognize that because you committed to showing up each week. I mean, you showed up today, even though the homework was challenging. And listen, you even chose not to run out on me a few moments ago, although it's not too late. Um, so what do you say uh, you pull out the worksheet and we look over it together? Okay, I think I can do that. I realize we're bleeding into time, so I won't have us run too long, but what skills did you guys notice? We, we had a lot of things that were already mentioned of kind of how you might repair there. Just before anyone answers, I see in the chat, um, I think that the main video- yeah, we feed... can't, I can't hear because there's some overriding audio. 
I think that if you um, if you go onto the main screen of the presentation and, and just mute that, um, you'll be able to hear this talk. Um, but they're in two separate um, platforms, so they, they are overlapping with with um, one another. So if you hover over the video on the main conference hall page, there should be a little uh, I don't know, volume button uh, icon. If you click on that, it should mute it. Into the okay, and I know we're running over, so we'll circle right back to um, asking that question again, Dr. Bannister, about um, what skills we think the therapist was able to use in the interaction to um, kind of repair and uh, manage the anger. I may have inadvertently just given it away because I did say repair. Um, so, um, so that is one of the things. Uh, so um, in the moment, um, uh, Dr. Goldman had kind of recognized maybe what she said was pretty invalidating um, and did not get the response she was hoping for from Aria. And so that ability to um, repair in the moment um, is really beautiful to be modeled um, for the patient um, and, and um, also to, it's very genuine. You know, she recognized that she said something not very helpful and was able to create that repair in the moment and stay on track, um, which is also really important. Um, and it's something I am a huge fan of. Anytime you can tie something into goals, do it. Um, reminding, you know, everybody kind of why you're there and, and what, what everybody's hoping to get out of it, you know, in the service of building that life worth living for. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm very DBT. So I go into the DBT language, but building a life that's meaningful and worth living for, for the patient um, and really um, helping everybody remember that in the moment. And I think, you know, one of the things that is so important here too, and I can reflect on my own experiences in therapy, but that concept of radical genuineness, like recognizing, I think sometimes kind of um, being the provider, we feel like we have to have like all of the right, you know, responses all of the time and we're human and we're fallible. And sometimes we say things and even with the best intention, they aren't received um, in the best way. And so to just recognize, oh crap, that didn't come out the way that I wanted it to. Um, and, and really just kind of fostering that, that, um, within the Alliance is just so, um, invaluable. Yes. And I, one more thing to say on that before I know, I think you might have one more slide, Dr. Goldman, um, but she was just not being afraid to take a time out. Um, so if the anger is escalating, um, and you've lost, you've lost it, or it didn't go quite the way you were hoping to. Um, not being afraid to call um, a therapy timeout and use grounding, use your mindfulness skills, use your distress tolerance skills together um, in session. Um, maybe you notice that power struggle started um, or the anger is continuing to escalate and we're not getting to that secondary emotion or maybe anger is taken over as primary. Um, so not being able to afraid to say, hey, hey, uh, you know what? I'm having trouble focusing too. And I think we're getting really off track with where we both wanna be here. I'm wondering if we can pause and get grounded. Um, and kind of bringing it back down for both of you. Because if you're dysregulated, you're ineffective as a therapist as well. Um, so, so ideally everybody's getting more regulated um, in the moment as needed. Um, and it, especially if you're new to working um, with people with a lot of emotion dysregulation or uh, anger makes you uncomfortable in general, you may need this a little bit more, especially in the beginning as you get used to it. Um. I'm thinking we should probably catch questions um, given that we're about five minutes over time. Yes, and I believe right. people are on a break if they need a break. Um, yeah, by all means. Um, we have some questions here, um, and but we welcome any questions that you have as well. So if anything up here resonates with you, um, please feel free to speak to it. Um, so I see so, one in the chat, um, if, if you'd like to take it, um, Dr. Goldman, or I'm happy to, but we've got, um, what would you say to a client that has been dropped by people, providers and friends who have assured her they would always be there? I think, 
for me personally, again, kind of not jumping right into like the problem solving or the saving, um, but rather acknowledging first what the patient's experience is, um, and then maybe um, using some like um, fact checking, right? Like what were the, um, what were sort of the variables around that um, situation? That's kind of maybe how I would kind of start that, that conversation. I don't know if um, Jenny or Heather, you have a thoughts on there. I, I mean, I, I don't know if I have too much to add. It'd be very similar of, you know, kind of let's look at the facts there. I, I guess maybe the dialectic too, of, um, it's scary to trust. There is a risk with trusting. And the only way to really kind of make progress is to take that risk. Mm -hmm. And so like, there's no way I'm gonna be able to say the right thing for you to know for sure. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think that I'm gonna be able to challenge that fear. I had a thought as you were sharing that as well. Um, it just in working with um, patients with trauma is, you know, we, can, we can't predict and control the future. And so we can't always, um, uh, control whether or not a traumatic event is going to happen as much as we want to say that and provide that comfort to our patients. And so um, that's something that is sort of a dialectic that I typically introduce when doing trauma work as well. Yeah, I think you guys covered it phenomenally. I also just responded in the chat to um, someone that asked kind of what type of grounding. So um, I am a big fan of grounding with the senses. Um, so I gave a couple of examples there. Five, four, three, two, one is just running through all five senses, name five things you can see, four things you can touch or feel, three things you can hear, um, smell and taste. Um, so uh, would you do that with the client in session? Yes, I would. I've done it mm -hmm. plenty of times. Yep. Um, so, um, you know, and, and you want to um, be gentle in your approach, not forceful, you know, and just say, hey, I, I'm feeling like maybe both of us are getting off track or we're not being effective with one another or, you know, whatever, kind of call a spade a spade, but in a, in a warm rock kind of way um, and then offer for that validation. I'm wondering if you might do some, some grounding with me so we can make sure we get the most out of this session um, and get ourselves back on track. Um, and then offering, if you know their favorite one, do their favorite one with them. If you know, if you have a favorite, could do your favorite. I think just kind of switch it up. If maybe there's one you haven't shown them yet that you want to do, um, it can be good to keep a list of a few in the back of your mind that are your go-tos though, for in, you know, those kind of tense, intense uh, in session moments. Thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't think I saw any other questions in the chat. There were some, some thank yous. Um, so Olivia, I'm hoping you are able to see the chat because um, there's some positive comments and feedback as well in here. I didn't pull it up yet, so I didn't take away from the screen, um, but I absolutely will. And I'm, I'm super thankful that everybody um, showed up today and for all of your participation. Um, I'm happy to answer additional questions if you have them. I understand that it's your break time, um, so don't feel um, compelled to stay. Um, but I'm also happy, and I'm sure um, Dr. Kiko's Bannister would be as well, to answer any questions.